Well, good morning and welcome to uh, Brant Community Church. Let me add my welcome to the one that Terry has given you, to all of you who are here in person, a growing number uh, week by week, and then those who are watching online. So glad to have you here. And today we're talking about family and the influence those people we call family have on us. But just as importantly, I want to talk today about the influence we have on them. So, if someone comes up to you and says these words, you're just like your mom or dad. Is that a good thing or a not so good thing? Is that a compliment or do you feel like that's some sort of a criticism? How many of you have said these words when you've looked in the mirror? I will never be like my mother or father. I just won't be like one of them or both of them. And then one day you stand in front of that same mirror and you say to yourself, I'm becoming my mother and father, and it can't be happening. And you're not thinking that this is a good thing. What have your parents done? What are the choices they've made that might make you feel this way? What is it about them? You know, they're character or their actions or something about who they are, what is it about those people that would make you say something like this? I just, I don't, I don't take it as a, I, I don't see this as a compliment, I see it as a criticism. When you think about what those things are, those, some of those negative things that you would not want to repeat in yourself or that you would not want to live out in your own um, circle of relationship, what are those things that you see? And here's the second question. Have you seen those very same things, not just in your parents, but maybe in your grandparents, and if you're old and if you've lived long enough, maybe your great-grandparents? My mother, for example, is a peacekeeper. She does everything you can to keep the peace. She will not confront issues. She does not like conflict. She sweeps everything under the carpet. She festers about it, but she does nothing about it. I saw those very same traits in my grandfather, who was a pastor. And I vowed that I would not let those things repeat themselves. And for a while, I think in my life, I did, but I was able to break free from them. And maybe you have something in your family as well. I mean, you know, there's that old saying, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Is that a compliment or is that not really a good thing? The metaphor I want to use today just to help us to understand this, it is this suitcase. No, it wasn't this left here. I'm not taking a trip right after. This represents the emotional, spiritual, and relational baggage that all of us will carry through life. None of us do life without a suitcase. None of us. For some of us, it can be pretty light. It's like carry-on. It's a small case, fairly positive, lots of good memories. It's easy to carry. But for others of us, it can be pretty heavy to carry. It weighs us down, slows our progress, impedes our happiness, adds to our stress, and messes up our relationships. Some of us have suitcases that are filled with pleasant moments, and some of us, they are filled with toxic moments and memories. Some of us have positive patterns that we see, and others of us see destructive patterns that prevent us from living the kind of life we want to live. The truth is, when it is our turn to carry these bags because they get thrust upon us, some of us have found them to be heavy to carry already because they were filled by our parents, grandparents, and even our great-grandparents in the past. It is family that fill these cases with either positive or negative emotional, spiritual, and relational moments. And they're either easy or heavy to carry, but all of us have them to carry. And when I use the word family today, I'm not just talking about parents and kids. I'm talking about parents and grandparents and even great-grandparents. And I think all of us know how powerfully influential the group who get to be, we call family, can be in our lives. They fill these bags with emotional and spiritual and relational moments and memories. Some positive, but for many, if we're honest, they are negative and at times can be heavy to carry. And some of us have tried to deny that it's there, run away from it, say we, we, we don't want to focus on anything negative. We try to break free from it, but no matter what we try, we not only have to carry it, but some of us, because we're carrying it, have added weight to it. And it's heavier than ever. 
Because what happens in one generation often follows to the next. The emotional, spiritual, and relational stuff put in this case, one, two, three generations before can still be ours to carry. And the the thing we have to be careful is that it also will become ours to pass on, to pass on to others we call family. Will we add more to it? This here is what's called a family genogram, and I use it in counseling. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to look at family members back one, two, three, and you can actually add another layer, four generations. And these, again, all families have stuff in them. All families have thing, um, things that are broken and marred. Well, I mean, we're, we're sinners, right? We all have sin in us. We all have that propensity to sin at times. And so, sometimes that sin will mar the generation and the generation after that. I mean, I've seen it in my family. I don't know if there is a family that has ignored this or this doesn't exist. There's just varying degrees of intensity of what gets passed from grandfather to father and to family. Certain family patterns in one generation, some of the negatives as well, but also the positive can be observed in the next. When you think of some of the negatives, you can see divorce in multiple generations, or addiction, or abuse, or anger, mental illness, poor marriages, mistrust of authority, mismanagement of money, inability for stable relationships, depth of faith. There's going to be these things that can be negatively passed down, negatively put in these cases, but there's positive things, and many of them are opposite. There can be strong faith, strong enduring relationships and marriages, strong morals, strong ethics, loving relationships, positive issues of character. But even if it's more positive than negative, the negative ones still exist. And we have, each of us, have been assigned a case to carry through life, every one of us. The problem is, is that we want to think about the positive and deny there's any negative, uh, that we're under the illusion if we don't think about it or talk about it or pay attention to it, that somehow it'll go away. And yet, it is many of those negative things that got passed down to you that have resulted in personal wounds and hurts of various degrees, and if ignored and unhealed and not dealt with, can lead to passing them on, filling, putting them in the case, and giving them to a future generation. Now, this is a biblical principle. And this is a principle that sometimes gets misunderstood and sometimes gets misused in church. But here's the principle. And it's given to Moses. He's being given the Ten Commandments for the first time by God. Those commandments that are about relationship building with God and relationship building with one another. And right out of the blocks, after he says the first commandment, you shall have no other gods, he says these words. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing. And we have to watch this word punishment because it's not quite what, it doesn't quite mean what we think it means. It could be passing along to the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Moses is being instructed by God saying, hey, tell the parents and grandparents they need to be careful because stuff gets passed on. And Moses is given the Ten Commandments a second time in Exodus, and the same thing says, as he passed in front of Moses, talking about God, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, talks about the character of God, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. So there's a forgiving aspect, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, and he punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And there's this principle exists. Whatever gets into one generation can be passed down positively or negatively to the next generation. Now, here's what I want to say. God is not punishing innocent people. That would be the way to look at it, that God is punishing children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren for these people's sins. That is not who God is. Scripture does not align with this. It has to be something different. And so what, it, what it's really about is God allows. He doesn't break the cycle. He allows it to continue generation after generation, and each continuing the cycle, either choosing to continue or choosing to break it. 
And God's warning Moses to say to parents and grandparents, it's up to you. If the cycle has got this far, it is up to you to break the cycle. That is the title of this message. It is about breaking the cycle and not repeating it. And in the series Thrones, we've looked at a king each week. And we've looked at their lives and we've learned a lesson from their lives that we can apply to today. Well, today I'm not going to look at just one king. I'm going to look at five or six kings. And they are in succession and they are in the northern kingdom of Israel. The northern kingdom is in the north and it's Israel. The southern kingdom in the south, it is Judah, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And this is these stories of these successive kings, although they're not directly related, they are since succession as kings of the nation. And you will see principles that get passed down emotionally, spiritually, morally from one generation to the next. And the name that gets repeated the most is a king that we've already looked at a few weeks ago. And his name is Jeroboam. And if you remember Jeroboam, he was responsible of taking the 12 tribes, or the 10 tribes of the north, and breaking away a divided kingdom from those in the south, where Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was the king. And we had the divided kingdom. We also remember the story that he did something very evil. He was afraid of the people returning to Jerusalem for pilgrimage feasts, so he set up altars that looked like golden calves. He did it in two places and said, the people will worship in the northern kingdom. God was not pleased, and um, God sent a, a, a message to, Jer- to Jeroboam, and, and this is the message, is what it says. Even after this, when Jeroboam was warned, he did not change his evil ways, but he appointed priests to the high places. These priests were priests of false gods, idol worship. And anyone who wanted to become a priest, he consecrated for these idol worship places. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to his downfall and its destruction from the face of the earth. So we, we looked at Jeroboam, and there's, there, there's some good, bad things that he did. And so the first king that comes after Jeroboam, his name is Nadab, Nadab, and he is Jeroboam's son. And this is what it says about him. Nadab, son of Jeroboam, became king of Israel the second year of Asa. Terry talked about Asa last week, uh, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. How? Following the ways of his father. Like father, like son. Did the same thing. Well, the king after him, he's not related. He's actually a king that took the throne by coup or rebellion, and his name is Basha. Basha. And this is Basha's summary statement. Talks about, you know, this prophet Jehu, son of Hanani, came to Basha because of the evil he had done in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger by the things he did, becoming like the house of Jeroboam, and, all, and, and also because he destroyed it. So, we have this next king, Basha, does the same things as Jeroboam. Next, Zimri. Here's what they say about Zimri, right? He, so, because of the sins he had committed, he died doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, and following the ways of who? Jeroboam committing the same sins as Jeroboam. Now we're now about in a succession of kings. Goes on. We have Omri. And it says this, but Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he sinned more than all of those before him. You notice it's getting more intensity. It's getting greater. And he followed completely the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, committing the same sins, causing Israel. And Omri has a son, and he has a son who is probably one of the more famous kings, and his name is King Ahab, married to a woman named Jezebel, and this is what it says about Ahab. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Notice the intensity. He not only considered it trivial, now he's trivialized the sins of Jeroboam. Do you see how this cycle, one king after another, and every one of them had a chance to to do this, to break the cycle. Every one of those kings could have changed their ways and not continued the cycle of the patterns of moral, emotional, and relational sin that had happened before them. They had the chance to break the cycle. And they had the chance to start a brand new cycle, one that was positive. They had the opportunity to do it. Every one of those kings had the opportunity, but they didn't. They didn't do it. And this is so important for me to say. 
that every person watching today, you have the chance to break the cycle of what has gone on in the past and begin a cycle that will positively impact future generations. Every one of us has that chance. It doesn't matter how old we are, how much we've messed up already, we have that chance to do something about breaking the cycle. And every person in this room has a choice to make. Will we break the cycle and will we begin a new cycle? Will we do that? All of us, here's the question. You have a chance. Will you make the choice? You have a chance. Will you make the choice? Now, you may say, I don't have any children. So it's already, the cycle's broken. You have nieces and nephews and other people you will influence who are younger. So don't let yourself off the hook. We all have a chance. The question is, will we make the choice? Will we take the character issues we struggle with, this emotional baggage we carry, the unwise choices we've made, the sinful patterns we struggle, many of them influenced by a generation or more before us, and will we end the cycle, start a new one, instead of passing it on, we'll put an end to it. Instead of adding to it, we're going to empty out this case, and we're going to start fresh. See, I think there are three groups of people here today. Group, the, fr- the first group is this. The first group is this. You have sig- you've had significant toxicity, and it's been passed down from past generations. You have grown up. You know it. You can see it. You've s- maybe you've worked on it in your own life. You know the pain of it. You know the hurt of it. That's you. There's a second group. The influence from the past generations is very positive, pretty positive. You could say, I don't have much negative stuff. I have pretty much positive stuff. And then the third group is those who have a little bit of both, a little bit of both. Now, here's what I worry about. I don't worry so much about this group. Do you know why? Because it becomes so obvious. They know something is wrong. They know something different has to be done. They know that it needs to be changed. They know that things have to be different. I don't worry so much about that group. It's a little bit more obvious. This group, a little less obvious, and I'm just encouraging that group, grab hold of the positive and begin to remove the negative. The group I worry about is this one. Because you think things are positive and you become blind or deny the negative because of the people who might have done it, and yet here's the thing, and you will see this time and time again, even if there's lots of positive and a little negative, the negative seems to get passed on from generation to generation and intensifies. And we can become blind to it and we can say, well, my parents were wonderful, loving people, mine were, and yet there was stuff that got passed on, that I wanted to change. And I made that decision four years ago to say, I'm not going to pass it on, and my kids are all growing up by then. So it is never too late. Let me just keep saying that. It is never too late to make these changes. It's, all, it's up to all of us to look into the case and discover what needs to be ended and what needs to be built upon. We need to identify which of these groups are we in and what has happened, even in this group. Are there things that have been passed on that we need to examine and say, you know what, I don't know if I want to pass those on anymore. This isn't for parents, and it's also for grandparents and aunts and uncles, siblings and influencers. We all can play a part. So as I wrap this up, I thought, is there a story in the Bible of someone who did this? And I'm going to look at a little obscure character from a book that I guarantee you few of you have read, and if you have read, you've skipped over this part. It's found in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Now, the first four chapters of Chronicles up until this story it's like this guy begat this guy and this guy begat that guy and da, 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 and it drones on and on. And when you get to that, you look at it and go, I'm not reading all this. It makes no difference to me. And you go back to try to find out where does the narrative, where does the historical story pick itself up? And you skip over this. And in chapter 4, they're looking at the descendants of Judah, one of the sons of the, nation, of, of the person, Jacob, who became Israel, Judah. And there are 40 names so far given in chapter 4. And it, it, all of a sudden, it's like this sudden break in four chapters. And, and, and in chapter 4, where in the middle of what seems this roll call of names where historians seem to drone on and on, interjects two verses deta- detailing the story of one man. And I ask myself the question, why? Why, why, why? Why did he stop? Why did he pause? Because it's important. Because I think this one man out of all of those generations is one that stands out as one who broke the cycle. And this is what it says about him. 
Jabez, that's his name. Jabez. Maybe you've heard of him. Maybe you haven't because he's kind of a hidden character. But it says that he was more honorable than his brothers. The word brothers here is all of the ancestors. He was more honorable than all of his ancestors. Something is different about this guy. And the word honor means that he was morally sound, ethical, a person of principle, integrity, and righteousness. It's like the historian stops, pauses, and focuses on this one guy who somehow is more honorable than everybody before him, that some, this one guy seemed to somehow Break the cycle. And it goes on. And it says, his mother named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. The word Jabez in Hebrew means one who who, who experiences pain or one who causes pain or sorrow. So he's one who experiences pain or causes pain or sorrow. And, she's, and it says, I gave birth to him in pain. We're not talking right here about normal childhood, you know, the pain of childhood. I never experienced that, but I understand it's pretty intense, but we're not talking about that pain. It, it, it's not likely physical pain. It could be relational pain. It, it, it could be that there's something with her husband that's gone wrong. He's either died or he's left or whatever went on because in, in Hebrew culture, Guess who names the children? Dad. This is a mom naming the children. Something has gone on where dad is not naming this child. Maybe she's been abandoned. Maybe it's something emotional. Maybe something financial. But some sort of pain exists, and she calls her son the one who will cause sorrow. Now, I find it so interesting that mom gets this little baby wrapped in a blanket and says, oh, I'm going to call you, cause you the one who causes pain. Like, really? What was she thinking about? Do you think he got any teasing when they, he got to school? Hey, there's pain. There's the one who causes pain. I'm sure the people went by and said, what was his mother thinking about? Right? You've done that with names. People name their kids something. You go, what were they thinking about? Right? Same thing here. But not only is a name in that day just a name, but it's very prophetic about how their life is going to turn out, and often it plays out based on the name. You think of Jacob, who became Israel, but Jacob means the one who deceives, and his whole life up until near the end, he was a deceiver. And so this is prophetic, and this mother is predicting that he's going to live a painful life because he was born in pain, and maybe there's generational pain, and the end result is going to be he's going to live a painful life. And there's this dark and painful cloud that hangs over his head describing some sort of generational curse. And like many of us, if we're honest, some of us, we could be named that because the suitcase was full of pain. And we had to carry it. Maybe it came from parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. Maybe it's negative core messages. Maybe it's issues of negative character. Maybe it's inappropriate actions. Maybe it wasn't even intentional. It just flowed out of their brokenness. In my case, that's exactly what happened wonderful, loving parents who in some of their own brokenness that came from a generation or generations before just kind of flowed out in my life. And then Jabez gives the secret of breaking the cycle. And it's through prayer. And he has this little prayer, and it's just a one-verse prayer, but we're going to dissect it for a few moments this morning. First, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Jabez cried out in prayer to the God of Israel. This is not a generic name for God. This is the name for God that provided the exodus, the one that God that brings freedom, the God that brings rebuilding, the God that brings restoration, the God that brings a fresh start. He cries out to the God who brings a fresh start. He wants freedom. He wants restoration. He wants rebuilding. To a, and he prays to a God who he believes can make it happen. And this is the first step, is that we need to believe that God is the only source we can seek to make this happen, to break the cycle. God has got to be an active part of it. He's the only one who will provide wisdom and guidance and direction and power to break the cycle and to start a new one. We have to put our faith in a prayer answering God. That's what Jabez started with. He believed there was a God who was powerful and merciful and wise, loving, able to make this possible, to turn, to make the changes needed. 
He admitted in and of himself that he couldn't do it himself. And he puts his faith in a prayer answering God. And then the second thing he does is he surrenders his agenda to God about how it should be done. He just says these words, that you would bless me. Bless me, in the, in, in, in the King James Version says, bless me indeed. Shower me with supernatural favor. God, bless me. Give me your unlimited goodness. But the idea here is not material blessing. He's not praying, bless me materially. This prayer has been used to, to, to try that. That's not what it's about. It's spiritual. It is tied with shalom, good relationships, peace of mind, lack of turmoil, end of strife. But what he does say is he says that you would bless me by doing these things. He just opens his hands and says, God, whatever your blessing is, I'm going to let you do it. He doesn't tell God how he wants him to bless him. He just says, God, you bless me as you want. Too often we want God to bless our lives in a certain way, to our agenda, to our desires. And when he doesn't bless us because we've prayed and we aren't getting the blessing that we think he should give, we often miss out on what that blessing actually is. It's allowing God to do it his way, not ours, And then we just sit back and watch and wait for God to work. It's letting God unpack the suitcase His ways. And for some of you, God to bless you might mean that you need to uh, go and see a counselor. Or it might mean joining a recovery group. Or it might mean letting go of something you're holding on to. It might be confronting something from your past that you want to ignore because the people who did it, you love them too much. It's just saying, hey, I need to break this cycle. I need to have God bless me, but He's got to do it His way. He's got to bless me his way. The second thing we have to do is examine and enlarge our circle of influence. Jabez cried out to God of Israel, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Now, the word enlarge means simply to expand, and the word territory is, is, is more of a sphere of influence than it is border. He's saying, I need to have a greater influence. Who in your family circle do you influence? Can you see the faces? Do you realize who is being influenced by you and how? What messages are you passing down? What through, you know, how are you demonstrating issues of morality and behavior and attitude? How are you rippling out into other people's lives in your family circle? Our circle of influence goes farther than we ever can imagine. Sue and I last week had this wonderful restful week with our five grandchildren. That's a joke. And as I looked at those little kids, and I knew this message because I'd already started working on it, I thought, what kind of influence have I had on their parents that those parents have had on those kids? And what influence will those kids have on their, my, their, my great-grandchildren, who I may never meet? And if I can have that kind of influence, it's kind of scary and sobering a bit. Am I willing to do what it takes to pass on the positive and to break the hold of the negative in that circle of influence? Because my choices will travel from one generation to the next and set in motion a sequence that is either positive or negative. Our relational, moral, and spiritual DNA gets passed down whether we like it or not. I hear parents when I say to them, you need to change some behaviors because it's influencing your kids or grandparents and say, your grandchildren are watching. You need to change or you, know, you, you need to think of doing it differently and often hear these words like, I don't want to change. It's my right to do it. No, it's not your right to do it. It's your responsibility to be an influencer. Jesus knew the importance of this and look what he says and this is sobering. He says to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to happen. But woe to those who it happens through. Woe. Let's make, take it seriously. Be better for them to, you know, have a rock around their neck and jump in the water than causing someone, these little ones, to stumble. We need to take it seriously. A verse is burned in my brain through the pandemic. When I read stuff on social media, is this verse. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, Christ follower, or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, rather ra- value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And this verse is, needs to be burned into us that it's not about us. It is about others. It's about the interest of others. It says about Jesus after this, that he became a humble servant, taking, you know, he became nothing in order to make a difference and to ripple in the lives of everyone else. That needs to be our responsibility. It is that willingness to say, I'm going to break the cycle because I understand the enormity of the influence. Next, 
practice his continual powerful presence in our lives, that his is God. Jabez cries out, bless me indeed, enlarge my territory, and let your hand be upon me. The hand of, used here is the presence and the power of God. He says, I can't do this without the power of God. I need to have that. I need God's presence that will convict me, God's presence that will show me where I need to change, God's power that will help me change. It's in the presence of God I get guidance and direction, and He provides me with the ability and the power and the discipline to make it happen. This in the New Testament is called the power of the Holy Spirit. We need that. We need the power and the presence of God. And then lastly, He says, allow God to correct and rebuild your character. He says, Keep me from harm, from the harm that others could cause and the harm that I could cause so that I will be free from pain. You know what the word there is? Free from Jabez. I'm free from all that was predicted and all that was promised and this cloud that's over my head. I want to be free from the pain that I feel so that I can be free, but I want to be free from it so that I don't harm others. That's what he's saying. He gives God permission to look deeply into his life and say, there's stuff there. I want you to deal with this stuff. Help me to heal from this stuff. Help me to bring it to the surface where you can walk, where it comes to the light and you can help free me of it. It's letting God examine our lives, doing this inventory of our lives to know that there's stuff there and deal with it so that we don't pass it on. Let's, you know, we need to break the cycle where there may have been some brokenness in the past generations, we can bring blessing to future generations. And as I say, some of you are going, it's too late. The damage is done. I've damaged my kids and they damaged theirs. Let me just say as clearly as I can, it's never too late. Never too late to change. Because when you do, you show others it is possible after years of not changing that there is a way to change. No matter how old you are, it is never too late to change. And so, I want to give you four things as I wrap up to think about this week. Do an honest assessment of the things that have been passed down from parents and grandparents, both positive and negative. Take some time to assess what's there. Identify one of the negative things that's part of you that's been passed down. What is one of those things? What is an action step you can take to break the cycle in that one area? One thing, one area, one step, and then I strongly encourage you to pray this prayer of Jabez every day for the next month. Jabez cried to the God of Israel, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be on me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. Pray that prayer. Sit back and watch what God might do. It is time for some of us to take this seriously, no matter what, to break the cycle and add a few new things, positive things, for the sake of future generations. Let's pray. So, Father, today, I just pray that you would just help us to have a glimpse into us. Some of us were blessed with wonderful parents. I know I was. And yet there were things there that needed to be dealt with, needed to be sorted out that they got from their parents and their parents got from their parents. And Father God, just help us all to recognize those things and and, and change those things and build in positive things, new things, new cycles, new patterns. Not just for our sake, but the sake of future generations. Because it says that if we do that, that you will forgive and that you will rebuild and you will restore and that you will make a difference for future generations for thousands of years. Maybe, just maybe, there's somebody here who says, for me, I'm going to start right now. I'm going to break the cycle and I'm going to be free from adding it to anyone else's lives. Give us the courage to look inside and the strength and the power to make those kind of changes. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.